What is the price of time? We don't think about it much, but since we are biologically finite life creatures, we do put a price on time, and that is what we culturally refer to as an interest rate. Joining me today is financial historian Edward Chancellor to discuss his recent book called The Price of Time, which is a history of interest rates, the 5,000 year up and down uh, ride of interest rates and human cultures, specifically the highest and lowest rates of interest ever uh, in the last 40 years and how low interest rates today have fueled what some could, uh, defend as the largest bubble in the history of our species. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, uh, is a former wall street professional. Uh, he writes for Reuters and the New York times and other financial, uh, press, uh, publications, financial times. And, uh, we had a wide ranging discussion on finance interest rates, and the future. Please welcome Edward Chancellor. <music> Greetings, Edward. Welcome. Nate, thanks for having me. Uh, it is a pleasure. So in addition to uh, some mutual friends, I think we have at least one other thing in common. We were both on Wall Street in the early 90s. I don't know, you were at Lazard. I don't know if that was in New York City, but I was at Solomon Brothers and Lehman Brothers in the early 90s in New York. I, I was in the, I was at Lazard, what was called Lazard Brothers uh, in London. Oh, in London. Okay, excellent. So you have written a incredibly impressive tome on the history of interest rates and monetary systems called the price of time. And uh, my work on biophysical economics, how energy, money, growth, behavior, the environment fit together, interest and exponential compound interest is a really central part of it. So you are now a world renowned scholar on this topic. And, and I hope we can spend the next hour or so taking a deep dive into humanity's history, present and future on, on the concept of interest. So Albert Einstein referred to compound interest as the eighth wonder of the world. Can you tell us what is the origin of, of interest? Um, well, I'm going to correct you to start with by saying that All right, Albert please. Einstein never actually referred to interest. It, that that was a um, that was a a comment uh, that interest being a, a wonder of the world that appeared in the mid 1920s in I think in a sort of American insurance advertisement, perhaps in your neck of the woods, not sh Chicago or or thereabouts, and like you know, a lot of comments. Uh, either ascribed to Einstein, to Keynes, uh, or to um, who's that? Who's the old baseball player? Um, who, uh, Mickey who, Mantle. Who has all the Babe Ruth? No. Oh, yeah. Yogi Berra. Uh, Yogi no, Berra. No. Yogi Berra. So, so but Yogi Berra, um, Einstein, and Keynes. If there are any sort of loose quotes hanging around, they they normally get sort of distributed to, between one of those three people. But in that case, anyhow, uh, <laughs> Einstein never said it. However, um, it, I you know, compound interest is uh, a wonder of the world and a pretty terrifying. A concept to behold, and people have been worrying about the concept of compound interest for millennia. Um, we first find um, the the notion of compound interest in Mesopotamian um, credit activities, and there's even the word for um, the Assyrian word for for uh, interest is mash, and the which means the uh, offspring of a, a, of a goat a kid goat uh, but uh, and compound interest is mash mash <laughs> it's, the only, <laughs> it's the only word i can say in in ancient assyrian anyhow um and we see um there was a dispute between uh two uh territories in in ancient mesopotamia 
um, over over some land which one 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 of the one of the territories claimed, and um, the other the other territory then called Lagash demanded uh, a back payment of, of rent uh, compounded uh, over a long period of time at I think thirty three percent a year, and the Lagash demanded of its neighbour the equivalent of eight trillion liters of barley. <laughs> <laughs> which is um more th- several times more than the US annual barley uh, output and you can see there the sheer impossibility of compound interest and then by the 18th century um a, a fellow um a, an english sort of philosopher st- statistician called um Arthur Price made a calculation that if um i can't remember what it was a sort of a, a a, a gold coin had accrued interest since the time of our saviour to 1770 uh, or thereabouts, uh, that, that go- the, the size of the gold compounded would be twice the, um, twi- t- the equivalent of twice the, the, the weight of the earth or the, or the volume of the earth. And that, that, that's, that, that, that sort of critique of compound interest uh, finds its way into... Uh, or the impossibility of compound interest finds its way into sort of socialist critiques of of, of of interest. So, for instance, Karl Marx picked up Price's uh, piece on the impossibility of, of compounding. And as you're interested in energy and um, and, and economic productivity and finance, uh, you're probably aware of Frederick Soddy, the the Nobel prize winner the english nobel prize winner chemist who i think he, you you know better than i did he got a nobel prize for the um discovery of radioactive isotopes or something anyhow so Fr- Fr- soddy get, got bored with <laughs> with chemistry and then became a sort of monetary crank in the 1920s and he wrote a book um i can't quite remember what it's called on, on the subject of, of what he called virtual wealth and there he also describes the the absolute impossibility of, of, of compounding you know compounding in a world of finite resources um to to, to, to in, in, in your, what you're thinking about is how how economic productivity is linked to uh, the energy that sustains life on earth and now in a in a world of 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 limited resources you can't have an infinite compounding so I have numerous reflections based on your initial comments. My first is I feel somewhat intimidated that I have to really up my game on this podcast because of your articulate British accent. It makes me want to be smarter for some reason. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful listening to you. <laughs> um, my second thought is I wonder if um, positive interest is... Uh, because we are biological creatures with finite lifespans. And so there is, like the title of your book, a price of time. And bearing on what you just said, though, our cognitive brains can understand that exponential growth and compound interest, like you said, the trillion liters of barley and the virtual wealth um, that Saudi wrote about, um, is an impossibility, but that's like a long-term thing. At the same time, our, our actual human steep discount rates that we care about the present more than the future wants stuff experiences consumption now. So the infeasibility of perpetual growth and exponential interest is someone else's problem, which is why we constantly recognize it and constantly kick the can forward. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, first of all, I think, yeah, as you say, we the humans do have um, prefer the present to the future and have a what's called a, a positive time preference, and this actually works to our advantage um, economically and financially, namely that, um, as I mentioned, you know, as I take the title of my book, the price of time. If you put a price of on time, you will use time more efficiently 
And that price of time is also a price of risk. So you will take your your risk more efficiently. Um, and you will um, and that's true whether you're investing in financial securities or whether you're actually um, engaging in, in in actually sort of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, so I think that that humans um, more mortality and and the positive time preference actually contributes to um, our economic efficiency of using scarce resources well. As for the compounding of interest, I think we have to take it with a a pinch of salt. Um, it's you know it's very easy <laughs> for a mathematician to you know work out you know, to to create a, um, a you know simple formula and say where well, if this compounds over x number of years the amount of debt will be uh, unpayable um and this is in a way the underlying thesis of of Thomas Piketty's capital in the 21st century where he argues that you know if if the um rate of return is above the rate of growth um you're going to get rising in inequality this sort of compounding of wealth in the hands of a few but it, but it actually ignores the fact <laughs> that as we all know you can have you know most people have investments and if they're not warren buffett they actually spend the money they receive so there is there is actually no compounding of wealth over an infinite you know over an infinite period of time but even over decades for as I say, everyone apart from the extraordinary perverse Warren Buffett, whose main pleasure in life is to enjoy the compounding of his wealth by not spending it. But he's he's a, a one off. Why is interest important or even a critical component to a healthy economy or a, a capitalist economy? Uh, you mentioned the efficiency of risk taking could capitalism exist without interest? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so I think so. Take I'll take the question at a sort of meta level first, and then get more specific. Uh, at a meta level, all our economic transactions take place across time, and we need something to guide those transactions now you know how are you going to balance your current savings with your future consumption how are you going to if you have future consumption needs and you're making an investment what will the return on that investment be relative to the consumption you need to make in the future uh, if you if we have if we have a certain amount of savings and a certain amount of demand for those savings what balances those two the demand and supply of savings. Uh, at that level, uh, interest it is necessary. And, and the the Yale economic historian Bill Gertzman, I think he he says that that interest that he says that finance is like a is like a time machine or a spaceship that travels across time. And he then says that, and I think this is right. He says that the discovery of interest is the most important discovery uh, in the history of finance because it allows for intertemporal transactions, for transactions across across time. And that that is true for all societies, not just for a capitalist society. Uh, somewhere in my book, um, I I cite a um, an economic analysis of the Soviet Union by a uh, Hungarian economist whose name slips my mind at the moment. Anyhow, he he points out that the fact that the Soviet Union didn't have an interest rate and they had you know, they had you know they had a central bank that printed money and high levels of inflation, but they didn't have an interest rate to help coordinate economic activities. They they relied instead on the central planner. And the central planner, as we know, um, well, at least most of us know, the central planner will never have enough information to coordinate all the um, all, all 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 the information uh, in a um, 
in an economy. And so you need, I mean, it's common, everyone I think understands that, uh, and this is, you know, the critique of um, of communism is that they didn't have a price, a, a price of goods to, to uh, you know, the uh, price of goods to uh, allow for the uh, dis- the, the supply and demand and for all the information contained within prices. But that, that tr- at a financial level, the most important price of all, what Jim Grant, uh, my friend, the financial historian and journalist, calls the universal price, the most important price in the system, in the financial system, is the, is the interest rate. So, And I think that's true for... Uh, all economies, but I think it's specifically true of a capitalist economy. You can you can imagine, for instance, a, a you know a, an agrarian economy, a feudal economy, sort of trundling along, <laughs> where you know someone is just you know uh, far, you know farming and and perhaps paying their dues to the landlord in 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 kind, um, not requiring that much. Uh, interest, although bear in mind, as I mentioned before, in the agrarian economies of 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 ancient Mesopotamia, they had interest, so that can't be a coincidence. But if we think of capitalism, what does capitalism? What what do we mean by capitalism? Well, uh, a, a it, it you know derives its name from the word capital, and then we think, well, what is capital? And capital is uh, is anything any object any it doesn't even have to be an object it can be sort of a what well, it can be a sort of service or it can be something embedded in 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 a piece of software um but anything that produces a stream of income over a period of time into the in in the future didn't the origin of of the word capital in your book you wrote it came from from cows or something like that yeah that's the that's the Latin, yeah, caput, the, the head of cattle, um, and actually all 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 these the language for money, pecuniary in Latin for uh, capital comes from caput of, of pecuniary is a I think flock flock of of of, of geese. Uh, the the word the ancient words for um, I mentioned mash being a kid goat in in. Um, in, in Greek, uh, the word for interest is tokos, which is a calf. So there's, there's a link, <laughs> if you're getting the picture, that the productivity of capital uh, is linked to interest. And I'd go back to what I was mentioning before, that if you have a an asset, whatever it is, that delivers a stream of income in the future, you need to put a present value on that asset because otherwise you can't buy it or sell it. I mean, how you know how would you price a share if you didn't have interest? Because if it had an infinite stream of income, the share price without a discount rate would have an infinite value. And and it's same true of a house. You couldn't have a you couldn't have a housing market without a discount rate applied to the future income. So with a a meta big history arc humans didn't need interest rates before the agricultural revolution because we didn't have possessions we were hunter gatherers but with the dawn of surplus and accumulating and storing surplus and trading in order to keep track and make sense of our world we had to have a price on time i think i think you're right that that i mean we obviously don't know what happens in a prehistoric period by definition but what we can once farming becomes settled and once there is um private property of some sort or at least property that people are laid you know whether it's an official or 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 an individual farmer someone's laying claim to that property if someone then wants to borrow that property and that property has the nature of being um productive then the lender is only going to lend that that um, that property uh, in return for for interest for an interest payment. In, in other words, a share a share in the profit. And they were instantly. I, I think I mentioned in the book they were doing that in the the Midwest in the in the United States 
up until the beginning of the 20th century that people were lending cattle and, and you know, taking the cattle back plus a calf at some stage in the future. That was the loan contract. So that type of agricultural loan contract with interest has been around for you know, four millennia or so. So I mentioned the role that interest pays in as a discount rate in the valuation of assets. And that allows for financial markets and real estate markets and capital markets of all sorts to, to take place. Um, I also mentioned sort of in passing that interest uh, is influences um, the nature of investment, re investment, real investment in the economy. So when we talk about uh, when you're making an investment, you talk about a, a hurdle a hurdle rate for the investment or a um, uh, sometimes p p invest investors will think about the payback period. You know, what's my payback period? Well, the payback period uh, it, it embeds a, an interest uh, in it. And uh, the, one of the arguments in my book is that having a, um, a higher payback period actually helps with the allocation of capital from low return businesses to high return businesses uh, and and that actually uh, therefore the interest rate or the existence of interest plays of uh, an important you could might even say fundamental role in Schumpeter's notion of creative destruction uh, uh, or, or and 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 within that is a sort of uh, you know, notion of sort of survival of the fittest, and bearing in mind that that it, as the interest rate, uh, it, when it becomes a hurdle rate, it it will influence you know the type of investment activities people make, and if they make, it's all well and good to make investments uh, with very long dated uh, returns, but at a certain point, you will you are likely to be misallocating capital and to be wasting money. And I think that's, you know, we're already seeing evidence of that, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, which was absolutely sort of inundated with capital in the last decade at the time when interest rates were zero and investors, you know, were, were crying out for high, potentially high return investments and the money went to Silicon Valley and some of it was probably well spent but a great deal of it was wasted in sort of pie in the sky schemes so I think that's a, another you know absolutely vital function of interest for the capitalist system let me read you a uh, a quote from your book uh, where you are quoting 19th century economist Irving Fisher Nature is, to a great extent, reproductive. Growing crops and animals often make it possible to endow the future more richly than the present. Man can obtain from the forest or the farm more by waiting than by premature cutting of trees or exhausting the soil. In other words, nature's productivity has a strong tendency to keep up the rate of interest. That makes sense to me in a pre-industrial sense, but now we are basing a financial and economic system not only on the interest that we get from the hydrological flows of the sun and the soil and, and the rain, but also the, the mining of, of non-renewable resources that we're depleting 10 million times faster than they were trickle charged by daily photosynthesis uh, in the form of coal, oil, natural gas, copper, other things. So how do you see that disconnect of our monetary system is treating these non-renewable resources kind of as if they were interest when they're really were drawing down capital. Um, you know, that's a point that my old boss, Jeremy Grantham uh, at GMO w often makes. Oh, that, um, I didn't, I didn't I, know I, you I, knew I, him. I'm, I'm a big follower of his writings. Right, and uh, we we worked. I worked with Jeremy in the asset allocation division, and Jer and Jeremy, you're probably also keen on Kenneth Boulding, the Economist. Uh, Jer well, Jeremy likes to cite him, a uh, way refers to sort of spaceship Earth, and sort of that yeah. you can't. How how can you have? How can you think of having infinite growth in a um, 
in the world on a you finite mean, planet. In, in, You're either in, a madman or an economist. Planet. Exactly. Um, now, my so yes, I, yes. I mean, uh, print, Edward, I'm one of those guys. But go on. <laughs> now, in principle, uh, a a low interest rate uh, should be associated with a longer dated view of the future. If, if if you think about sort of time preference, it's sort of lack of impatience, and um, and in in that case, then perhaps a low interest rate would be associated with sort of allocating resources in a more sustainable way. However, uh, one also then has to look at the evidence of the world around you and say that the low interest rate of recent years actually doesn't appear to be associated with um, you know, long-sightedness, but actually sort of extreme myopia. Um, and and I cite, and I think the best example of that is actually China, which I cite in the book. That you know the the you'll know this better than I do. But am I right in saying that sort of um, something like half of man-made carbon emissions have taken place since the mid nineteen nineties? Um, and the great that's correct. You know, bulk of bulk great bulk of the increase has come from. China and China has had, you know, to my mind, uh, you know, the greatest real estate boom in history. I mean, the valuation of Chinese real estate relative to GDP looks you can you can't really tell because the Chinese, needless to say, won't give you you know, accurate data. But it looks to be uh, roughly on par valuation wise <laughs> with the Japanese. Bub real estate bubble economy of the 1980s, but then you know, as, as you're aware, you know, the, but that has been uh, accompanied by an extraordinary uh, building uh, of 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 um, residential real estates and uh, and and also of of infrastructure, and um, funded with with debt at very low rates of interest. So uh, I, I I mention in passing in the book that that actually the environmental catastrophe that China itself has unleashed in the last 20 odd years has been encouraged by these extraordinary low rates of interest. Otherwise, at higher rates of interest, you wouldn't have had the credit growth and you wouldn't have had the investment boom. And bear in mind, you know, China's investment was running at, you know, roughly 50% of GDP. The Chinese cement consumption, as you know, cement is very sort of, to production, conventional production of cement uh, is, is very polluting. And yet, you know, Chinese cement uh consumption per capita was you know uh over a ton per capita roughly on par with where the spanish got to when they had their crazy real estate boom prior to the uh global financial crisis but you know spain had a population of 30 odd million and china's population was 1.3 billion so uh, you know that was a lot more cement and a lot more emissions so here, this is our first conversation, Edward. Um, so you don't know a lot about my views, but here's here's my meta view on on finance. Uh, bringing it back to what you just said, there's something in ecology you mentioned uh, um, before we hit record that you're studying how some of the things of Howard Odom. Howard Odom um, had a theory on the fourth law of thermodynamics, which he called the maximum power principle, which states that organisms and ecosystems in nature self-organize so as to better degrade an energy gradient. Um, in other words, energy is the currency of life. And it is true that in nature, uh, a tree will grow the right amount of leaves, not to be the most efficient, um, or not to grow the most amount of leaves, but to have the right amount to access the amount of sunlight with all the shadings and everything else. I would argue that finance is a tool that humans use as a social contract to increase our cultural metabolism to access energy in the same way that a tree grows the same amount of of oak leaves so just hypothetically let's say that 50 years ago debt 
was not introduced in a massive way globally. And for whatever reason, we humans had no access to debt. Then as resources became more difficult to extract, we would have had to tighten our belts. We would have had to conserve and innovate with higher resource prices. And, um, but instead we went a different route. We used finance as a way to turbocharge the size of our economies, our cement production, uh, the whole thing. And as you said, a long dated view of humanity and sustainability would have a higher interest rate, which would have acted as a, 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 a dampening feedback on our consumption and growth. But in order to keep the mouths fed and in keep our consumption going, we did the opposite. We had very, very low interest rates. As you write about in your book, this might be arguably the biggest bubble in the history of our species because of what central banks have done. Um, that was a mouthful. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah. Well, I mean, when you mention the um, Howard Odom's idea of, sort of uh, ecosystem extracting, arranged to extract energy, and how a uh, you know, a tree grows to an optimal height um, with resource limitations um, and, and ga gathering energy um, work from its leaves and so forth. Um, I, I, immediately, it reminded me, as I mentioned in the book, it, I don't know when, you know, you, you must have been to, you must go through New York from time to time. You see these little skinny towers and these skinny towers that sort of almost touching the sky, these tiny little uh, needles for billionaires <laughs> and they they strike me as being you know a tree that has grown too tall or you think you know i went talk about the misallocation of capital in recent years in you know vc i mean imagine that we you know on the one hand you know people worry about um about co2 emissions at the next hand with venture capital funding space travel <laughs> i mean it you know tour space tourism for it it doesn't really make much sense so and i and go back to china uh, and the you know you see that the you know the you know china becomes a sort of wasteland and uh, as it as large parts as it given over to building and and the and the then discharges go into the sea um, creating these sort of dead zones there, and and I, as I say, I, and bear in mind, actually, it now occurs to me that we talked earlier about Soviet Union. As you know, Soviet Union was the worst, as far as I understand, like the worst polluter of all time. Um, and I'm not saying that <laughs> the absence of interest in the Soviet Union would directly well, not, not worse than China related. Oh, oh yes, probably not worse, and uh, probably not worse in terms of emissions, but worse in terms of you know just degrading your environment. You know, sort of. I mean, from what one reads, you know, sort of pools of you know crude oil lying around. You know, um, and it, well, it if you if the interest is a um, it encourages scarcity and prudent use of resources and. It then actually a high interest will actually encourage and you know will get you closer or a higher interest will get you closer to a more efficient extraction uh, of e you know economic output for the unit unit of energy. Um, I mean yeah, that's an idea. Uh, can I say Nate? There's one idea that that I mean it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. I haven't really embedded it. I haven't put it in the book. Which is namely this: if you, if one buys the sort of Howard Odom view that that you know all economic activity, uh, you know all economic growth, all economic activity results from transfers of energy and extraction and use of energy, um, and you know we can clearly see that you know over the sort of last three hundred years, you know, shift from you know what sort of coal-fired coal industrial revolution in Britain and then you know, then uh, oil and natural gas uh, to the current day. And we're now moving, regardless if, e even if you don't, even if carbon emissions are not your primary concern, there is a scarcity to, to those natural resources, in particular to oil. 
and oil gets becomes more and more expensive over time to extract you know they the you you can no longer just you know stick a stick a uh, a rig in the you know in texas or in or in saudi and and pull it out at almost no mar no marginal cost um and as so that if you take that view then actually you could argue that the trend global trend rate of economic growth in the economy is naturally declining and and if that's the case and if this is sort of big if if the interest rate were connected to the rate of economic activity which is sort of some argument i'm sort of come i half warmed that argument in my book um then you could say that this is an underlying that the that the rising cost of energy extraction or declining energy return on investment actually would be linked to a decline in um in interest rates i didn't i didn't actually put that in my book um partly i think because i came to the whole howard odom thing just as i was coming to the end of the book and i didn't seem to uh be able i didn't know how i could integrate it but it, i think it's an interesting thought I mean, i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it on that subject uh i've i have a lot of thoughts on that i think um i think you're right um that we are kicking the can of the okay so productivity in my opinion is a function of innovation and technology combined with the massive energy surplus we get from fossil fuels which the math of it works out to 500 billion human labor equivalents per year relative to 5 billion real humans and uh the mineral uh contributions and we've taken those latter two things for granted because we've always had more and it's generally been cheaper um but productivity growth peaked 50 years ago at exactly the early 70s when uh also oil production growth peaked uh, we still have positive productivity growth. It's growing every year, but it's growing at a declining amount. And what we're doing is we're trying to keep all the demographics and the various aspects of society um, fed and happy and stabilized by stimulus checks, by artificially low interest rates, by too big to fail guarantees. And so paradoxically, at a time when we should be getting biophysical signals of inflation and higher interest cost because resources are getting more scarce, we are not willing culturally or politically to admit that. So we're doing the opposite, kind of like we're solving a credit crisis with more credit sort of story. And we're reducing interest rates and guaranteeing other things and not allowing what you referred to early as the creative destruction and in doing so building a bigger bubble yeah now i, I well think think back to how the europeans responded to russia's invasion of ukraine last year natural gas prices went through the roof all these governments that are you know putatively committed to uh, net zero 2050, or at least they say so. And yet the moment gas prices started to rise, in the, I'm talking about natural gas prices for home heating, uh, started to rise in, in Europe, the governments then availed themselves of very cheap borrowing. And this was when you know the central banks ha hadn't really uh, given up their quantitative easing uh, projects, or at least were right at the end of the quantitative easings, and the cost of government debt remained very low, and the government were just going out and borrowing to subsidize not new energy production, uh, but actually just to subsidize consumption uh, exactly. as, as it stands. And that that, that seemed to me, um, well, I mean, I can under, you know sympathize if a person has trouble heating their home, but for a societal basis, you know, I I I got the subsidy. I didn't need it. Um, it didn't make any sense at all. And, and actually, of course, what does it do? It prevents you from actually economizing in your your energy use. Uh, there's another interest. I mean, you probably picked this up, and I probably mentioned it in passing in the book. But the very low interest rates 
as you know, encouraged uh, a lot of venture, a lot of um, uh, ven venture capital or or, v or um, high yield investment uh, in in um, high yield debt investment into these U.S. fracking and the shale, and that uh, those were. Um, and perhaps you have a different view, but it seemed to me that those were uh, businesses uh, that didn't actually generate uh, uh, the amount of uh, return uh, required to keep them in business, which is why you know, firms like Chesapeake went bust. But they did, in the near term, give you a little boost of extra oil production at a at an uneconomic cost that kept people that kept a lid on on uh, oil prices in the in the near term. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, it, it's so interesting to unpack this in real time with you because we don't know each other. Um, and I didn't know that you knew about the term energy return on investment. I wrote my PhD on that topic, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, so in the beginning well, of I your did, book... I did, by the way, Nate, I, I, I did a podcast the other day with this guy called Paul Chapman. Does that mean anything to you? So he's, he, no. he does podcasts about, about commodities and, and so on. He, he was, anyhow, he's been pursuing that sort of e -ro interviewing people on this sort of E-Roy. Oh, don't get me started on E-Roy. I think it is a fantastic concept, uh, um, conceptually that we can create money but we can't create energy and the energy has a cost in biophysical terms not in dollar terms but to try and make decisions on it and use it as a fine laser a digit that a 10 to 1 eroi is better than an 8 to 1 it, it's fraught with peril in my experience because the um a lot of judgment goes into the comparative into the boundaries that you use on defining things yes yeah, so because I hear there is a lot of debate, isn't there, going on between what's the eroy of uh, of wind, you know, of onshore wind, offshore wind, solar panels versus the eroy of you know, your your conventional, or you know, and I think you know, depending on which way you lead, <laughs> you can come up with, uh, you know, well, give give me the eroy you're looking for. Or is that is that unfair? Exactly. That that's exactly right. But here's why it's important is because. <clears throat> Our society and our institutions and our cultural stories and our expectations were built on something like a 20 to 1 EROI or higher in aggregate. So friends of mine who are experts in this think that the inflation rate, setting aside central banks for the moment, the inflation rate of a society should be 1 over the, the EROI. So if the EROI is 20, then inflation should be 5% a year. And as EROI declines from 20 to 15 uh, or down to 10, um, the inflation will go up because there is um, harder access to get copper and oil and things like that. Of course, that's not what happens in reality because by decree, central banks declare what the interest rates are. Um, so that, that is the, the huge, um, gauntlet that I think we're facing now, the biophysical gauntlet of energy and resources are telling us one thing and interest rates and money are telling us another thing. And we're headed for a, a giant reckoning between those. Now, I mean, my, so, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One is something I took away from Odin where he, he talks of, um, Inflation, if you remember, being uh, the decline in in the value of money relative to a unit of energy. <laughs> uh, so that that I suppose because if you think about it, money allow, allows you to because it can be translated into things that produce energy. It can, it actually allows you to sort of transfer energy. So I can see if if you're if you have too much money relative to a declining eroy or a declining source of surplus then uh then the the it then you'll get to get inflation the other thought i think uh and, and why i said earlier i was i only gave a sort of qualified approval to the notion that interest is linked to uh economic productivity because you you see um in the ancient world and this is pointed out in the great book uh by 
Sidney Homer and, and Dick Siller called History of Interest Rates, which goes back to the same time period as my book, um, back to Mesopotamia. And what they describe is these sort of U-shaped... Uh, and did, did you pick that up in the book? I think I included a a, a chart in my book from Homer and Silla. This it, U-shaped interest rates uh, over time, so whether it's in Mesopotamia, in Greece, or in Rome, that each time civilization goes into decline, as it reaches a late stage, interest rates are very low. And as the, in, as the civilization starts to decline, then interest rates start going through the roof. So, um, and that sort of, you could see that would make sense um, because as a society could it, is could it, could it be because of Could it be because of the lack of trust suddenly? The, what is yeah, the role of trust in interest trust. rates? It, it could also be greater risk. It also could be to do with, and the risk might also include debasement of the currencies or inflation that tends to take place as societies collapse. And it could also be linked to the uh, scarcity of resources. So in fact, on the one hand, you might say that the interest rate is linked to our productivity, but also it's linked to the scarcity of resources. So if you have a society that's collapsing, then resources become more scarce. If you want to borrow my my sheep, or if you want some grain from me uh, to carry on farming, I'm going to charge you more because it's no longer as abundant as it as it I was now before. have to so pay you back number. triple mash, 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 mash. Yes, something like that. <laughs> so that's not a uh, good foreboding, Edward, that you said that historically there are U-shaped interest rates and right at the time of uh, civilization upheaval, interest rates are very low. What does the concept of massive, a few years ago, massive up to 16 or $17 trillion worth of negative interest rates in Europe, uh, that's no longer the case now, but under what biophysical scenario does a negative interest rate make sense other than speculation and uh, the momentum of central banks' uh, past decisions? Well, I don't. I mean, if 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 interest is the price of time, a negative interest is putting a negative price on time. It's it's turning the clock backwards. And so you had, you know, in Europe, you had um, you you had a sort of Alice in Wonderland world. <laughs> I, mean, I mentioned so you know that you could actually buy thirty year, let's say, Swiss government bonds with negative yields, in the expectation of capital gains because rates were still continuing to go bad. People, you, you were buying negative yielding bonds for capital gains and holding conventional stocks for income. I mean, how crazy does that sound? Um, no one caring about yields any longer. The fact that that in Europe, com not only were companies able to, normal companies able to borrow at negative rates, junk bond rated companies borrowed and negative rates so there was no pricing of risk and um there is another i mean is this linked to the negative rates but a, a point that um bill gross your ex um pimco the so-called the old, the old bond king made he said you know he says he he said he was saying you know roughly 10 12 years ago these very low rates don't make any sense at all because a healthy banking system needs positive carry. <laughs> and uh, by getting rid of the positive carry in the banking system uh, and in the financial system uh, at all, or, or at least putting the carry down to very low levels in which someone's taking on a huge amount of duration risk or interest rate risk by buying a long dated bond, you're building up a huge amount of risk in the system. So I think, you know, um, I, I think that these negative rates and the ultra low rates are, um, to my mind, their end product was the sort of the COVID market mania of 2020 to 2021, which um, which Warren, Warren Buffett's sidekick, Charlie Munger, said was you know, 
the craziest financial markets in, in all of history. Now, I don't know how much you know, history Charlie Munger knows. You know, he's been around for a while. But I, mean, I think that's, you know, I've read quite a lot of financial history. And I can't think of any markets in aggregate that were quite as crazy as what we saw in the last, you know, a- ending at the beginning of last year. Well, you stay tuned for 2024 and 2025. So um, in your book, you have a chart at the very beginning. I don't know that the the screen can see this, but we'll share it. That shows 5,000 years of interest rates. And with the exception of the very beginning, which is 3000 BC, the highest and the lowest interest rates have been in the last 40 years. What is up with that? Um, actually, I would say the, the highest would have been, I think, I mean, the two, two um, several countries compete for highest rates. Um, I think Germany had very high rates right at the end of its hyperinflation. I think that Brazil and Argentina in their high, hyperinflations, they had very high rates. So clearly, uh, and now you, you're not going to get a hyperinflation without a paper currency. Um, and so clearly the very high rates uh, or uh, uh, linked to the arrival of, of fiat currencies and and high inflations. And then the very low rates also linked to the fiat currencies in that once you move into a world of fiat currencies, then the central banks have a much greater say, determinant of what the interest uh, can be. There's no, there's no, I mean, they, they used to talk about the so-called zero lower bound as if that they, and then they discovered actually, hey, we can take interest rates before, below zero. So you would never have, it, in a world in which, um, you know, the the u- units of money were restricted by some hard rules, say, such as under the gold standard, you're going to have much more, um, much more restricted movements in interest. And and in fact, under the gold standard, what you see, uh, interestingly, is you had very stable long term rates and very volatile short term rates. Um, in order, and the volatility of the short term rates was necessary in order in, in, in order for the central bank to make sure that it kept enough gold bullion in its reserves to cover its note issuance. Now, in once you move into the fiat money era, we get the sort of opposite. We get more stable short-term rates because you know central bankers don't like um, they don't like you know economic downturns, or whatever. But the the net result is much more volatile long-term rates. And um, so again, that's not you know a particularly comforting thought because if we, in the twentieth century we saw the lowest interest rates ever and the highest and the 20th century the 21st century we've seen the lowest in history so the question then would be do you then make a step you know at some stage to even higher than we've seen them before i don't know so you also wrote a <clears throat> very popular financial book called devil take the hide most which was about uh historical financial manias let me ask you this edward at all of these historical financial manias, people in power were delusional about the risk. Either they were delusional or they were helpless to the momentum of what was going on in the day. How is this time any different? I mean, you look at the Bank of Japan now has bought 50% of the government of Japan's government bonds. Um, how, I mean, how do, how big of a bubble are we in and how disconnected from reality are the central bankers and the people in charge or are they cognizant of the risks that we're discussing, but they're just powerless to, to avoid, um, you know, turning the heat on for people and, and getting food delivered, et cetera. Well, I mean, go back to the historical manias as I point out in Devil Take the Highmost, it, it's not just that, you know, the, the, the manias tended to take place with the active connivance of the political authorities who it were often sharing in the games. You know, the classic case was the South Sea bubble in which the uh, took place in Britain in 1720, in which the government, the company, which was um, run by these crooked people, the sort of Sam, Sam Bankman Freeds of their, 
of its day. Um, they went. They actually just bribed members of parliament. They bribed the King of England <laughs> in order to get their scheme off the ground. And right through, and you see that right through to you know, the Japan's bubble economy in which politicians are involved. I think uh, in the recent years, um, I think the 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 uh, the the, the very low interest rates and the sort of illusory wealth that they've created, the virtual wealth, uh, suits <laughs> suits the politicians absolutely fine because the politicians have a um, you know have extremely short uh, time horizons, whatever they say, and um, so actually the very low interest rates help you know as we used to say kick the can of various problems down the road you know, if, if you have uh, if you have incipient um, pension problem you know if you have a, a society with l inadequate savings then the easiest way to deal with the uh, inadequate savings is to inflate the acids of what saving has taken place which you know what's happened in america it, it, i mean i did I, I didn't mention it in the book but i did crunch the numbers a few years back and what you find is that in the U.S., uh, a U.S. household wealth, as measured by the Fed, used to move in line with U.S. net savings. Sort of would make sense. You know, you save and it becomes a piece of wealth. But then over the last 30, 40 years, it's diverged. So we have the less we save, the more the interest rates went down and the more actually the valuation of what assets we had Rose. So, in fact, you had an inverse relationship between wealth and savings. You know, to me, almost a definition of a bubble. Um, and um, yeah, that suits the politicians very well. Uh, do the central bankers understand it? I, I don't think. I think their problem is, is cognitive. I think that they they just they they have models that don't describe the world, and they have. I think you know my. I suppose my view and my background is a historian before going into banking and investment. But my view is that the central bankers, many of whom are sort of drawn from the ranks of sort of physicists and mathematicians, have no real understanding of actually what an economy or a financial system is. It's sort of their understanding is is, is limited to to models that do not in any way describe the nature of the complex economic system that we have and, and that that would explain why you know think of it over the last you know 30 years i mean look at the epic mistakes the central banks made they 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 didn't see or understand that the dot com bubble they didn't understand the credit boom at all they just said hey you know I mean, with the dot com bubble they said mm, you know uh, we live in a world of efficient markets. Who are we to say that this is a bubble? With the credit bubble, they said, um, oh, well, one person's debt is another person's asset. Hey, who cares whether, you know, debts and assets are rising in tandem? Uh, give me, you know. And then, then when, you, when you've got the low interest rates, they said, well, oh, well, these are to do with, you know, declining population or something in the real world. We, we've got nothing to do with that. I mean, you know, even as they were actually going about deliberately manipulating short and long-term rates to levels that had never been seen before. Then you get to the position, I mean, as I'm ranting now, but then you get a position of the inflation, which they unleash, where once again they fail to see it and fail to, and, and fail to, to and constantly fail to, to acknowledge their responsibility for. So, I, I mean, I think that the, uh, that the central bankers, as a community as a whole, are... are um, you know, uh, exhibit sort of groupthink and a failure to actually analyze in a modest way, recognizing, you know, one's own, you know, one's own with humility, the complex nature of the system and the impact that their actions are having on this complex system. I fully agree with that, but it's almost too late in the game because if they really did understand the risks, I, I think, well, I mean, what is the way out? We're, we're being squeezed by both directions here, by energy and resource depletion, by geopolitics, by uh, declining uh, real productivity. And 
look at what happened with the Fed raises in the last 12 months. All of the uh, um, bonds on bank portfolios, you know, th th they have paper losses on those things, especially in Europe if they're, they own negative yielding debt. In 2011, Edward, I met with one of the voting members uh, at the time of the FOMC talking about these things. And he said, we have models that look at 2% growth in the future, and then we have quarter percent variations up and down from that. And I said, well, what if growth in the future is zero? I didn't even say negative. I just said zero. And he had like this blank stare. And he's like, well, that would be bad. So I, I think they just implicitly assume that the animal spirits of productivity and human ingenuity will eventually uh, continue to grow. Uh, and if we grow, we can pay back our debts and, and things like that. So I, I personally have come to the conclusion, uh, which is one of the reasons I liked your book so much, I, I do think we're living in the greatest bubble of of our history, and we are making the bubble bigger by not acknowledging the bubble. Um, or do you do you agree with me? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that, so that's part of you know. Go back to what I was saying earlier about the interest as a discount rate. Well, you know, if you take the discount rate down to its lowest level ever, you're going to inflate uh, the valuations and what we got was the so-called everything bubble, a bubble in everything. And um, and you can see that, you know, going back to what I was mentioning before, the Fed's US household wealth and 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 you and US household net wealth uh is far above its long term average. I think sort of round I'm saying off the top of my head, around 150% of GDP above its long long term average. And that bubble in wealth seems to, as I mentioned earlier, seems to be inversely related to the decline in interest rates. And in fact, every time the central banks have met a crisis, whether dot com or uh, Lehman and so on, each time, as you know, they've taken interest rates down to a lower level and we've had a bigger bubble following it. And I think now, yes, we're at the uh, highest you know, highest level of of net wealth. I, I looked at the recent data for published for this year, and that that's come off. You know, really hardly at all. Do you know, despite the big sell off in the markets last year. Um, so, if you're going to get mean reversion, I'm not saying you will, but if you're going to get mean reversion, then you've got a lot more uh, wealth to to uh, evaporate. And and as I say in the book. You know, you know, a definition of a bubble economy is an economy that is dependent on the bubble. And so because all these income streams are related to the bubble, you, you and I have worked in finance. Obviously, our incomes at the time were dependent on how much you know market activity was going, you know, how much uh, financial market activity in you know investment banking or what the valuations of markets were. So you're, you're if you're in finance, which in the US and UK have grown to much higher levels of of national income than in the past, your in your income is 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 a derivative of of, of of the bubble valuation. So and then when you you end the bubble, you have to have a massive reallocation of resources. It's probably a good thing, but it um you know it it doesn't take place overnight and it's not very easy and and as and there are obviously huge amounts of vested interests in keeping the bubble inflated as long as possible so the last big bubble that burst was the uh 1929 to mid-30s uh credit collapse uh in the u.s and and in europe but after that, we had 40 or 50 years of growing oil production um, still ahead of us. This bubble, that is not the case um, with, with resources. So how do you see this all unfolding, um, either in the short term with the Silicon Valley Credit Suisse current banking 
uh, um, a crisis or this decade um, with this this larger bubble? Are we going to have hyperinflation or deflation? Uh, will we switch from a 2009 situation of a too big to fail and find that we're going to be in a situation of too big to save? like France or Japan or something like that? What, what are your uh, speculations on all that? Um, well, first of all, I, you know, the thesis of the book was that these ultra-low rates had got into all the cracks of the financial system and of the economy, and that therefore the system was would be extremely resilient uh, so uh, seemingly fragile or non-resilient to any interest rate rises. And that's what we've seen over the last year, you know, the market selling off. And then we had the UK pension funds almost going bust. Um, and then we had, you know, the cryptos, you know, I mean, I know it's a sort of laughable sideshow, but you have the sort of crypto wind, winter. And then more seriously, you have the problems in the in the regional banks with Silicon Valley Bank going under. And there. That you know, that as I point out to in the book, the ultra low rates created a huge amount of duration risk or asset sensitivity of you know that market sensitivity to changes in interest rates. And I and and I and in a way, all the problems we've seen to date are linked to uh, this duration risk or interest rate risk. And I think slowly, um, this you know the policy making world which appeared to have been oblivious I mean, as you know in the f investment world people have been talking about this for years yeah um uh, but i noticed that this week you know the imf chief said you know oh the world faces central bank should go should be careful what they do there are a lot of risks out there there's a lot of interest rate risk so that's one uh, you know, one point is i would expect if the central banks continue raising you will uncover more problems in more different areas and you won't necessarily know where they are but you know I, my, my own view is you know it's not my job to analyze the entire world but to give people a framework to start analyzing their own areas um i think the one of the problems that go that once you realize that that the question of the sensitivity of the system to interest rate hikes uh which is an inherently um deflationary uh uh impact is that the central banks uh, will then become reluctant to tighten or they've lost they're not I mean I think they already are they won't admit it but you can see that you know that that interest rates are massively negative in real terms and have been over the last couple of years and um, and if you can't use the interest rate lever, uh, to control inflation, and, and let's just assume that you know governments will continue to be fiscally profligate, uh, then uh, then you're going to th then you're actually in danger of having uh, much stronger uh, inflation. And then there's another problem to think about, which is that the central banks they're not just have an in incentive to keep interest rates low, but they're already going back to use their balance sheets to support tottering financial institutions so the bank of england came out to you know to help to to step into the uk gilts market to buy gilts when the pension funds were going bust then you know the, now the you know the fed is is offering i mean offering this financing to the us banking uh at, at a, whereby they're taking the collateral at, at, at i think they're taking it at par value rather than a market price so i can hand over to you uh, 80 million dollars of market price of collateral and get 100 million dollars back from the fed so the fed is then taking on more the central banks are taking on potentially uh more security risks on their portfolios at a time when they're already losing money on their portfolios this, so, this is what i meant by too big to save is the central banks of the world are acting kind of like leveraged bond funds <clears throat> in cahoots with the governments that that they're associated with but it can how does that end well i mean so people are very people are very blithe about central banks not having negative equity the 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 reserve bank of australia has also has a, already announced that its equity has formally been wiped out um the 
Bank of England, which has an indemnity from from the UK Treasury for its asset purchases, its quantitative easing asset purchases, it recently sent uh, to uh, Her Majesty's Treasury a note saying, "Well, if we were to run off our securities um, under such a scenario, we may have losses of two hundred billion pounds." Which we expect to be indemnified for. Well, that's actually <laughs> quite quite a lot of money. I mean, it's sort it's roughly um, it's not quite as much as the government spent on the COVID policies, uh, but it's you know in the um, in that region. So it it so either you get a situation where, as far as I see it, uh, the central banks just inverted commas print money to or operate with negative equity, um, but that there's a situation where they they if they're printing the money to make good their shortfall, then that would seem to me inflationary, or the taxpayer makes has to make good, which actually would be hugely painful. And and the the, the one other point I make, Nate, is that over the last I mentioned to you these very ever lower rates to keep the bubble afloat over a thirty year period from the dot com bust, you know, well really from the LTCM hedge fund bust in 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 the in the early fall of 98 each time rates have been brought lower got a bubble then we brought it lower so the bubble requires ever ever lower interest rates uh, it is not just enough to 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 say okay we're not going to be as high as we would have been we're going to have to have lower interest rates because you have to inflate the bubble to give people the wealth <laughs> that their savings and the returns on those investments w- won't have. You have to, the, the economy is entirely in the bubble economy. It's hooked on capital gains. And um, you have you can only produce those capital gains by ever looser monetary policy. Now, I don't think that, so I think that, yeah, I think I don't know exactly what's going to happen next, but I, you know, I don't think over the next five years, you know, we're going, you know, it's going to be smooth sailing for sure. It, well, yeah. So uh, one other point that we didn't talk about, well, there's a lot of points we didn't talk about, but if you look at the increased duration risk because of the raising of interest rates, that's a problem, right, for the viability of the financial system. But also the amount of government debt, like the United States is now over $32 trillion in debt, and that's fine if we're paying 1% interest, but if we pay 5% or 7%, some historical average interest rate, we're going to be paying so much of our annual income on on debt service that it will be untenable. So that's another reason that we want to have low interest rates. But let me ask you this. I agree with you. I think we will, um, the the default path is we will quote unquote uh, print money to kick the can further. You're a financial historian. Are there any examples in history that come to mind of a similar uh, tenor where people got austerity and realized this, and instead of printing money, they actually took the economic pain, had the creative destruction go on, and then that, that you know, they came through that and had some other options. Or does it always end with print until something implodes in, in the culture? Um. I was thinking. Actually, I'm been. I'm reviewing a, a a new book on inflation. I was thinking about, you know, wh- when does inflation come about, um, and and when does it not? Uh, and actually, it's curious. So, for instance, in the U.S. during the Civil War period, you know, the Union was issuing these greenbacks. Greenbacks were depreciated in value, but then after the war, uh, they actually retired the greenbacks. At their old par value. So, in other words, the um, you know the Washington actually decided to to um, to, you know, to yeah to redeem to to make good on the on on the on the dollar. Now, it, it also true after the um, in the Napoleonic Wars, um, Britain had ran up a huge amount of debt to fight Napoleon, and uh, the gold conversion the, uh, of, of banknotes was suspended and after the war they actually brought back the banknotes to par with gold and, and restored convertibility after the first world war 
Britain actually, again, having gone off the gold standard, did actually go back onto the gold standard at its old par, admittedly creating quite deep problems. And I'm thinking, okay, so that's one set of problems where cases where the these countries actually um, you know, didn't go down the 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 sort of uh, default or the inflation route. But then the, the other cases after the you know, First World War, you had you know hyperinflations in 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 Austria, in Hungary, in in um, in Germany. And so so what are the difference? It's like the victors, <laughs> the victors actually um, can hold on to their currencies and will actually take great great uh make great efforts and the the whereas the demoralized uh countries that have been defeated whose whose societies are fractured and whose economies are weak are more likely to take the inflationary route or even the hyperflation hyperinflation so you have to i mean we're not fighting a war but you have to think are we are we a winner (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or are we a loser? I, I would argue loser, that we are we are fighting a war. We are fighting a war right now. Um I mean we're we're making the biophysical phase shift from both from a unipolar to a multipolar world with Russia and China um and others having a say. And also I think the Ukraine war was kind of a shot across the bow from the narrative of money and technology are powering society to uh, resources, particularly energy, are really important. Russia and Saudi Arabia together uh, are, are account for 45% of world oil exports. That oil is that's available for purchase. And so I do think that, that war and geopolitics are also part of this story that, that you're telling. Um, so from a monetary perspective, given all of your readings of history, what sort of broad guidelines, uh, I, I'm not asking for an antidote to the current bubble because that would be too large of a question, but what sort of broad guidelines might you offer uh, from a historian's perspective on a more durable, stable monetary system in, in the future? Well, I'm, I'm glad you didn't ask me how we would get out of this current Ampas, because I think that's 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 too big of a question. Difficult. I know. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm thinking. I have been thinking. I I think we we need a, a new type of monetary unit. I, I mean, I'm not saying go back to the gold standard, but this um, you know, this fiat fiat currency that we've been playing around with, um, you know, for the last fifty years since Bretton since the collapse of Bretton Woods. Uh, it, it it it's it's associated with you know a period initially a period of very high inflation and then these series of asset price bubbles and and financial crises and um i think we need to move and and as i mentioned as we've constantly talked about it's also associated with us handing to a committee of people uh a at the central banks a the the a uh, power or control over the most important price in the uh, in in the economy the the price of time the the interest rate and no 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 end of it. and we can we can laugh at the you know ridicule or, or or pull our hair out at the at what the central bank has done but you know um, you know no individual they they they've been handed an impossible task and so I think we have to at some stage uh, get back to a world in which um, a monetary unit that cannot just be increased uh, at will, whether by a central bank or a commercial bank. Uh, And uh, we probably need to deal with the leverage of a fractional reserve banking system, which, you know, really, you know, from, well, from, I don't know, from time, Immemorial fractional reserve banking is a it, it has its own um, has its own uh, you know, weaknesses. Uh, you, you have too much leverage, and you have an asset liability mismatch, which is what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. And the the answer, you know, we can design a 
a financial system that in which you know the banks actually don't take leverage that your deposits are not levered into long dated loans and and i think we'll and uh, i think we'll have to go down that system once we've got rid of the current mess and there is a future in that for um for fintech if you want there is a future in that for uh for banks going you know much closer you know closer to what's called the chicago model where they simply own short dated uh, government debt to cover their their li- their liabilities and then the you know credit activities uh, can take place out of the banking system and and not to be but in which the losses are you know are contained um and in which in a, in such a world if you limit the um the growth of the core money you should then get an interest rate which more closely matches the savings the actual savings and actual demand for savings in an economy and therefore the you know i don't i don't know if there is such a thing as a natural rate but you can see that there is a rate of interest which isn't that manipulated um in, in, if you went back to a world so to speak where where the currency is hard in a way it isn't today I I agree with that and it's an incredibly complex question. Um I I wrote a paper like 10 years ago that referenced the annual interest of forests that grow is 2.8% to the volume of the forest grow at 2.8% a year. That's what can yeah, be sustainable. I'd like to see that. Harp. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that paper. Okay. And I mentioned, didn't I, that, that Karl Marx sort of teases refers to the tree theory of interest for there was a german is he called art a a r n d or something like that a german economist of the 19th century who who said you know he said the interest derives from nature and is linked to the annual growth rate of trees but we're subsidizing that with all kinds of things that are one time endowments i refer to it as the carbon pulse which is now um you know starting to very soon to decline still very very powerful and the amount of of uh of, of wealth that we get from that dwarfs the 2.8 percent interest on on forest growth um so i agree with you that in the future there's got to be some there's two questions how do we navigate the current bubble without destroying society that is its own problem and then what is a more sustainable monetary system for future humans and i think that that second question there has to be some biophysical tether to land land productivity energy something uh, because to run the world kind of like a casino or a leverage bond fund and when you get in trouble you double down and leverage more is is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I think the the Hayek, the the Austrian economist, and actually I think Ben Graham, you know, the securities analyst, analyst, they both uh, you probably know this. They both, um, as far as I can remember, suggested a currency reform in the nineteen thirties of a commodity based currency. And um, I mean, as for having land as a basis <laughs> for a banking system, that was actually the original idea of John Law, who adapted it slightly to create the Mississippi bubble. So the trouble is, if you right. create <laughs> credit, if you create credit on land, um, then you actually can have a sort of you, you've created a perfect bubble machine. <laughs> so uh, you have to be quite you have to be careful of what sort of well, limitations you put well, in. Well, let me ask this then: uh, forget about all the. Um the details is the creation of bubbles itself part of our human genome um possibly i i think we would i think we would probably have bubbles if it weren't for monetary excess um uh, because you know people can get excited about things and because particularly you know new technologies have first mover advantages that and and excess returns you know like microsoft did in the 80s and 90s they got the whole sort of tech tech bubble and dot dot com boom going so i, I think and and it, that's not necessarily a bad thing sort of uh, uh, in which 
you have a, a period in which people are thrashing around for what are all the myriad opportunities available to us. Um, I think the trouble is that when it's underwritten by uh, an easy money policy, it goes way too far. And um, and then, you know, what we've done in the last 25 years or so is we sort of, uh, I'm just repeating myself, but, you know, we pushed ourselves further and further off course. So I think that having, you know, Silicon Valley come up with some ideas and, you know, it doesn't really matter if nine out of 10 ideas fail, if one idea is a good one. But if you have too much money uh, going to Silicon Valley, you ha have a, a massive waste of, of resources. Do you think that uh, between now and the eventual popping of this bubble, that central bank digital currencies will be a reality so that governments can control, maybe they even would have uh, your currency have an 18 month expiry date. You have to go spend this uh, before it expires in order to boost aggregate demand. What do you, what do you think about that possibility? Well, you know, we lovers of freedom <laughs> are quite worried about the potential for CBDCs because, um, you know, if the central bank can look into every one of your transactions and cut you off when you're doing something that is not sort of socially approved um, and, as you say, actually even threaten to take your money away if you don't spend it, which is just returning to negative interest rates, uh, it's a massive expansion of the state into people's personal lives, and uh, it, it's um, uh, uh, and to my mind, you know, yeah, I mean, people have referred to C C CBDC as a, a digital panopticon. The panopticon being the the prison designed by Jeremy Bentham, in which an individual prison guard standing at the top could observe every every action within the prison. So I think that that would be, and I think, you know, that's where China seems to be going pretty fast. And it, um, that that would be very worrying if our central banks and politicians were to go down that route. I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who, who sits in the British Parliament. And he says that the, the Bank of England is pushing through on its uh, CBDC plans without any parliamentary scrutiny. Which is, I think, is extraordinary. <laughs> that if money is a sort of power in a in a uh, in a society, and, and the CBDC gives you the greatest power that has ever been known to man, that you should hand all that power to a bunch of people who have so conspicuously failed in recent years without any oversight is um, is you know extremely worrying. Having said that, um, if you a well designed CBDC, backed by um, by government debt, so it wasn't didn't just conjured out of the air, could be a sort of hard money. If it, if and when I say well designed, that would mean that it it it, it could only increase by you know three or four percent a year, and that you can see that would you know that would sort of take the world of the Chicago plan, fully backed money into the digital sphere. It would be hell, a nightmare for the commercial banks because they would lose all their deposits to it. Because uh, who would want to you know, keep their money at Silicon Valley Bank or whatever when you can keep it at, at, at a, at a center, on a central bank app that more, much um, more easily. But I mean, for me, you know, it, the, all the convenience of, of those functions uh, would be more than outweighed by the loss of privacy if a central bank could could had complete control over it, and I and and obviously you know we've gone through sort of <laughs> you know number of of unprecedented restrictions on our liberties in recent years. So uh, so I I think that's probably something one you know one wants to lose a bit of sleep over. We've covered a lot, but at the same time, we've really only scratched the surface. Uh, I don't think people understand. Uh, I think followers of this podcast understand the centrality of energy and resources and the environment to our lives, but we take for granted the price of time, which is the price of money in our global uh, economy. If you, if you have a few minutes left, I'd like to ask you some personal questions that I ask all my guests. 
um, just a few of them. Given your lifetime of well, scholarship on finance and financial issues and your recognition that we're living through this incredible Wiley Coyote uh, financial bubble, do you have any personal advice to the viewers of this program at this time of kind of a pending global economic crisis? Um, well, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, from what we've uh, been discussing, it seems to me to make sense to um, consider sort of the inflation proofing of your investment. One of the things I you must have picked this up on reading Howard Odom that gold actually has an extraordinarily high innate energy content, uh, and if I you know. And in a way, Bitcoin, so digital gold has a sort of fabricated energy content of completely wasting resources. Um, so it makes me um, feel quite, um, you know, feeling that one wants to hold gold in, in the current environment, a sort of balance to the portfolio. And, and gold wasn't doing particularly well last year in dollar terms when the dollar was strong, but seems to be coming back. So that, and then I think that I mean, what I mean, you probably have stronger views on that uh, than I do on this. It seems to me that the energy transition is uh, people, are, you know, haven't. I mean, one can't believe it, but the the policymakers seem to make commitments that the, that five minutes of analysis would tell you are impossible to meet. In which case, I think that um, you know, conventional energy. Uh, is you know remain which has done well in the last couple of years, you know uh, will is required and will is you know will deliver as it's done over last year year or so uh, decent returns beating the market, um, and I think that probably holds true for a, a broad sway of raw materials because of low investment in recent years. So there is this you know during the um, during the German hyperinflation, there was a um, there was a saying uh, uh, that, that that people there was what they called a a flucht in die Zackwerten, a flight into things of real value. So we've been living in a world in which things of virtue, you know, that we we've ascribed value to objects that are purely virtual, such as you know your cryptocurrencies or your non-fungible tokens or rubbishy works of contemporary art um, and um, the you want to position to my mind portfolios in assets of real value um, and if you will and if you can also assets you know that that are robust um, and robust to questions of inflation or rising interest rates and, and so forth and I, I also, I'm going back. I, I, you know, I got. I, I think that, you know, now that the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities have a positive yield, um, that's, you know, that makes them more attractive from an investment perspective, notwithstanding the fact that the governments will be very loath to pay you, the, <laughs> the, pay you the uh, if if inflation runs out of control. But there, there's, I think, you know, I, I'd steer clear of all nominal assets really and all purely financial assets, but that's my own preference. So I'm sure we do have investors and speculators and asset allocators listening to this show, but most people are, are pro-social thinking about themselves and their communities in this time ahead of what I refer to as the great simplification. Uh, investments aside, do you have any personal advice on, on how to cope or prepare in these times? Well, I always think, you know, it helps to live quite modestly. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 for years, I just tell my wife, you know, whatever you think you're worth, cut it in half <laughs> and live off that. So in other words, don't, don't overstretch yourself um, and lead, you know, and, you know, lead a simpler life uh, uh, as possible. I, and 
in a way, you know, one can lead a reasonably good. I mean, I'm living in the country. I'm, I think I've seen anyone for four days. <laughs> the um, so you can lead 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 quite a comfortable life, um, and quite. And I haven't spent any money. So you know, you know, it's not. I just you know, I think it's shoe extravagance and luxury, um, and I I do think. I think I suppose I, you know this is what I've done myself. I was brought up in the country, but I think that life will be easier in the country than in cities going forward uh, in the difficult times ahead. Again, again, I think back to the hyperinflation where the poor wretched Germans, you know, starving in these cities in Berlin or whatever, they they would go out in the middle of the night and and steal the turnip. They would walk fifty miles to steal turnips from the farmer's field. Now, I'm not saying we're we're there, but the point is that you want you know you, there is there is actually a certain value in 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 having a sort of sustainable, you know, and quiet life. And a rural life. I mean, after this conversation, I'm going to go off and plant my 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 vegetable seeds. <laughs> so bet, we better we better wrap after, up shortly, otherwise this, the day will be done. Yeah, we better we better wrap up shortly. You could never guess what I'm going to do after this conversation. I am going to take get in my walk. car. No, I did that before this conversation. I'm going to rush down to the post office box where my 25 one day old chickens have been uh, FedExed to me. And I got a call this morning and I have to go get them. And it's 18 degrees here Fahrenheit. And I have to immediately put them under a heat lamp. Uh, so it's my new, my new chicken, uh, uh, flock for this year. So, uh, another reason I'm yeah. wanting to, to wash the clock. Um, so I, have to, I, have to say, you... I hope you know that chickens attract rats <laughs> as, as, as long as you're oh, prepared. We have for a rat. huge rat problem. Not, yeah, not yeah, to you, give you, too you, much you... information, but my last crop of chicken babies, the rats got like a third of them. They ate through the plywood. So now I bought some uh, spray foam to cover the holes that is uh, unappealing to mouse, mice and rats. So yeah, too much information, but uh, I agree with you on the rural existence. Do you have any recommendations to young humans that are learning about energy and uh the economy and and bitcoin and interest rates and the world that they're inheriting with climate change and everything else uh, do you have any recommendations to young people um well i mean i think you you're you're if they're listening to you they're on the right lines i think you know i spent the first you know decades of my world thinking about finance and economics without taking on board energy and the role of energy and the more i think about it the more important it is um and i so i think that yeah i think listening to your podcast is probably quite a good thing um i i think i think one of the things i find nowadays is um and possibly among the younger people i mean not actually in my own family or, or among my extended family but one hears that uh, younger people are less tolerant of argument um and debate um and you know and perhaps prone to fixate on on ideas that um are quite you know scary <laughs> um and therefore get a bit hysterical and my view and look we've had been in a way we've been you know obviously a lot of thrust of our conversation has been um you know worrying about the state of the financial system however you know i think that one needs to keep an open mind and one needs to you know it, you cannot make any type of intellectual advance um or you can't even really hold a, a decent view in your head unless you're prepared to be skeptical you can be skeptical of everything we've said and that's absolutely fine I mean, it's a loss of skepticism in the current environment that really and that you know obviously one finds it a bit you know among the young but and in all these sort of hypercharged you know ridiculous debates which you already have mentioned because you get your head chopped off um the 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 you need to be open-minded and skeptical and i think also i mean again i'm plugging a case of being one of the ways of being open-minded is to read history i mean if you read history then you see hey you know as jim grant says your man keeps on stepping on the same on the same fork <laughs> so we keep on making the same mistakes and our behavior in the you know in the past has 
obviously not being quite exemplary. And we can see similar patterns. And in a way, that should also give you hope, because however crazed we are today, both in our society and in our finance, sort of some or other, there is an end point. You know, and at, at an end point, there is a regeneration. And history, you know, history is in a way easier to deal with because it, it's past and therefore you don't have to live the pain or worry about the the future. But I, so I think, I, so I, as I say, skepticism and, and some sort of historical balance is probably, I think, most vital today. Otherwise, you'll lose your sanity. I like that answer. And, uh, in a subsequent email, I will ask you to recommend five or 10 of your, your best history recommendation books. And I'll put those in the show notes for, for people to, to, um, check out. Um, so we just met on this conversation. So hopefully this won't be too personal, but I'm just curious, you know, knowing all this living in, uh, the countryside in England, what do you care most about in the world, Edward? Well, I tell my wife it's my dog, but I'm really just teasing her, aren't I? <laughs> I think... <laughs> but my Not dog so much. Is I think the feet. dogs would be pretty high. <laughs> dog and wife. It's, I'm a wife and dog man at heart. Okay, excellent. Um, I have four dogs, and uh, they are very close to my heart. Uh, second to last question, sir. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and there was no personal recourse to your actions, what is one thing that you would do to improve human and planetary futures? Well, I, I suppose given what we're talking about is I would like to... I'm sure everyone gets the same answer given where we are today, that you'd like a source of energy that was plentiful and um, and um, non-polluting. Uh, but in my field, going back to what we were saying earlier, I would like, I would like, I think I would like a, a monetary, a, a form of money that couldn't be manipulated like the paper money is, and, and that therefore would be would give us more stability, financial and social. Social. I don't. You know, the, I haven't said it so far, but you know, the social hysteria <laughs> that we see today, I think, is actually linked in some weird way to the to the lot to the corruption of values created by these monetary distortions we obviously see that in times of high inflation because you know obviously the germans as they keep on saying went nuts during the hyperinflation and its aftermath but even with this monetary manipulation not associated with hyperinflation i think it sort of unloosens the the bonds of society so i suppose that's one reform i would like to see we would need both right because if we had uh, energy abundant energy that was clean but it was tethered to a uh, leveraged financial system that would allow it to happen faster it wouldn't work so we would need both we need the sustainable cleaner energy and we need a a more uh um cardoned off financial rules system i think um Excellent. This was a great conversation. What are you doing now? Are you writing another book? What what uh, what is uh, well, what topic actually, is is burning so for you? You, meant, you know, I mentioned Jeremy Grantham. Well, I'm I'm my current project is to help Jeremy write his memoirs. So, um, in fact, actually, I'm wow. speaking. Yeah, so, I'm spe at the moment. I'm speaking to him, and we're sort of gathering information, and then you know, here. Oops, I've got all his quarterly letters in three volumes of these <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so sorry, that's going to be my my project this year hope jeremy doesn't let me down and um then i've got a couple of other ideas you know um in the pipeline but it, actually the the jeremy project um will keep me going for the year at least excellent thank you so much for your time and uh let us definitely stay in touch Okay, nice to speak to you. Yeah, and send me your references. I, I'd like I'll read the stuff you sent me. But the other thing, I'd like to read the, the thing about the interest rate, the interest and in trees. It's right up my street. 
by that Nate. I will do that. If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 